I'm Young Moo Kim, and this is Applied Digital Signal Processing. In this video, we explore the convolution theorem and its implications on filter design in the frequency domain. At the end of the last video, I said that filtering, that is convolving by the impulse response in time, was equivalent to multiplying the signal and filter representations in frequency. We're going to dive into the details of that statement, and we'll see how we can put that insight to good use. Let's start by specifying some of the conditions required to formulate filtering as convolution. This depends on a few key aspects in the design of a filter or system, and recall that the terms filter and system are interchangeable. First, the system must be linear. Let's say we have a system, H of n, that for a particular input signal gives this output. Let's call this input x1 and this output y1. For a different input, x2, there's a different output, y2. And for a third input, x3, we get another output, y3. Now, what if we add together x1, x2, and x3 and input that sum? If it's a linear system, then the output will be the sum of the individual outputs y1, y2, and y3. This property is called superposition, where adding input signals together results in superimposing the individual outputs. And this extends for any number of input signals x1 through xk with known outputs y1 through yk. Next, what if we scale an input to a linear system by a constant? If input x1 results in output y1, scaling the input by factor a1 will result in a corresponding scaling of the output by that same factor. So to be linear, a system's behavior must conform to both superposition and scaling, which we encapsulate with the following input-output relationship. One way to think about this is that if we already have the individual responses to x1 through xk, for any linear combination of those inputs, let's say 1.1x2 plus 0.3x5 plus 0.9x8, we don't need to input this combination into the system to determine the output. We already know what it will be. The second condition for our filters is fairly straightforward. For a given input x of n and output y of n, shifting the input by a number of samples m results in a corresponding output shift by the same number of samples. This is called time invariance or shift invariance. Put another way, if we put x into the system, we always get the same output y, whether we put it in now, a few samples later, or hours or days later. It has to be the same result, which just makes sense. These two key conditions, linearity and time invariance, define a class of systems that adhere to both, which we call LTI systems. So why is being LTI such a big deal? Well, what if our input to the system is the delta function, or impulse, which is one at time zero and zero everywhere else. We've already labeled this particular system output, the impulse response, as h of n. Now, let's take an arbitrary signal, x of n. By linearity, the output to just the first sample, or x of zero times delta, is x of zero times h of n. With linearity and time invariance, the output to the next sample, x of 1 times delta of n minus 1 is just the impulse response h times x of 1 shifted by one sample. Now, this is true for all samples of x. In this way, any arbitrary input signal can be deconstructed into a set of scaled and shifted delta functions. So then, the output of an LTI system is just a combination of correspondingly scaled and shifted impulse responses. This should look familiar. In fact, it's convolution. This is why convolution works. It is simply the superposition of scaled and shifted impulse responses H. And this highlights how for LTI and only LTI systems, the impulse response tells you 
everything. It fully characterizes the system, allowing us to compute the output for any input signal. Let's see this in action, graphically, on a longer signal. At time zero, the impulse response h of n is scaled by the value of the signal, x of zero. If we slide forward in time, the impulse response is now shifted by n naught samples and scaled by the signal value, x of n naught. The output, y of n naught, is now the sum of all of the scaled and shifted impulse responses overlapping at that time. Because the impulse response is causal, meaning it has no values before time zero, we know that y of n naught only depends on prior shifts of the scaled impulse response up to the current time. As we continue sliding the impulse response across the duration of the signal, we can see the overall smoothing effect on the output. An alternative view of convolution that we've depicted previously is to rewrite the convolution sum slightly. Instead of h of n minus m, let's write it as h of minus the quantity m minus n. That's equivalent to reversing the impulse response in time. As we slide the reversed impulse response, we multiply h of n by the signal in the overlapped regions. Summing these values provides the output y of n naught. Again, as we slide across the duration of the signal, the output is smoothed. Note, this is absolutely equivalent to the prior method. It is just two slightly different ways of looking at convolution. Let's now return to the big reveal from the last video. That is, in the frequency domain, the output of an LTI system, capital Y, is equal to the Fourier transform of the input, capital X, times the Fourier transform of the impulse response, capital H, which is also called the transfer function, or system function. This may already feel obvious, because we've seen how the frequency response of a filter emphasizes or attenuates the signal at different frequencies. But how can we be certain of this relationship? It's a fairly straightforward proof, especially if we look across all time to account for both infinite and finite duration signals and systems. For a sampled signal of infinite duration, we apply the discrete time Fourier transform, multiplying the signal by a complex sinusoid of frequency omega and summing over all time. Next, we can apply a substitution of variables, replacing n minus m with a new label n prime. This means we can also replace n with n prime plus m. The summation variable will also change, but since it's from minus infinity to infinity, the limits remain the same. If we factor the complex exponential into two terms and rearrange the terms so that the sums only include terms with the variable of summation, we see that each sum is itself a DTFT, resulting in capital X of omega times capital H of omega. This relationship between convolution in time and multiplication in frequency is known as the convolution theorem. It's a really big deal for signal processing. It provides a clear intuition about filtering or convolution in that it shapes a signal's frequencies. It also has implications for filter design. Previously, we examined basic filter design in the time domain and looked at the resulting response in frequency. With the convolution theorem in hand, could it be easier to do the opposite, design our filter in the frequency domain as capital H of omega, and then transform back to the time domain? That sounds kind of ideal. We could then use the inverse Fourier transform to determine the time domain impulse response, H of n. What if I want a low-pass filter? but a very strict filter that lets everything through below some cutoff frequency and eliminates everything above the cutoff. We call this the ideal low-pass filter. Now remember, the frequency domain has symmetry for real signals, so it must be mirrored for negative frequencies. Because we want our filter to be digital, operating in discrete time, the full response must be periodic. But with the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, we only need a single period from minus pi to pi, so we can describe our ideal low-pass filter, capital H of omega, with this expression. To determine the impulse response, h of n, we put this expression for capital H of omega into the inverse DTFT. 
Since h is 1 between the negative and positive cutoff frequencies and 0 elsewhere, we simply change the limits of integration and then integrate the complex exponential. Evaluating the definite integral, we find an expression that looks familiar. By Euler's formula, this is just sine. So we arrive at this expression, which is in the family of what we call sinc functions, where sinc is defined as sine of x over x. Sinc functions turn out to be quite common and useful in DSP, but there's just one problem. They're infinite in duration, extending to positive and negative infinity. Yes, the oscillations get small as you get further away from time zero, but they are never completely zero. So we can't store or compute this type of infinite length impulse response, since this one doesn't rely on output feedback. This means that the ideal low-pass filter is not realizable in practice. But what if we just cut off some of the smaller oscillations? This would keep it finite in length, and then we can also shift the response so that it starts at time n equals zero, keeping it causal. This is the same as applying a window, in this case a rectangular window, so we can call the result a windowed sink. Turns out the resulting filter still looks pretty good. Here's the absolute magnitude, which still approximates the ideal low-pass filter. And here it is in decibels, which shows quite a bit of attenuation after the cutoff frequency. It sounds pretty good too. So let's summarize what we've done. We designed the ideal low-pass filter and frequency, and used the inverse DTFT to analytically determine its impulse response, the sync function. We windowed the sync to make it finite in length, and then convolved it with the music signal. Alternatively, we could have specified the filter as frequency samples capital H of K and taken the inverse FFT to get H of N and again windowed that. Either way works. Assuming you use a long enough FFT, you get the same H of N. But you might be asking, why don't we just implement the filter directly as a multiplication in the frequency domain? To do this in practice, we'll have to use the FFT. I'll cover this process in detail in the next video, but here's a quick overview. Take the FFT of X of N, multiply that by H of K, which is really just keeping the frequency values of the signal we want and setting the others to zero. And then we take the inverse FFT of the result, Y of K, to compute the time domain output. It seems like that should work. We'll start by listening to the previous windowed sync filter and then compare that to the FFT multiplication method. Uh-oh, this sounds terrible. What's gone wrong? Looking at the spectrum of the output may give you a hint. There's definitely some kind of aliasing going on, but it's different from the kind we've seen before. It's actually due to a subtle detail of applying the convolution theorem via the FFT, and I'll explain the cause and how to avoid it in the very next video. To wrap up, let's review some key aspects of designing filters in the frequency domain. First, the convolution theorem provides an intuitive view of filtering as multiplying a signal by a transfer function in the frequency domain, thus shaping the frequencies of the original signal. While we can specify ideal filters in theory, there are limits to what we can implement in practice. We can get close, but not perfect. Finally, frequency domain filter design is a powerful tool but it's not well suited for designing in terms of adjustable parameters like center frequency and bandwidth. You could design such functions in frequency, but this can have unintended consequences, and we've just seen how you can run into issues when carelessly multiplying FFTs. Instead, we'll pursue a different approach for parametric filter design in a future video.